You could either play to win or you could play not to lose. I choose to play to win. Playing not to lose is somebody's going to beat you because you're playing it safe. And I look at people that compete with us, they play not to lose. We play to win. I'm sitting down today with Frank Foti, the CEO of the Telos Alliance. Frank, thanks for being with us today. I appreciate it. I have to say, Kirk, this buzz any business. No, I had, I had to do that. So. <laughs> All right, I'll, I'll behave now. Uh, I see where you get a lot of your inspiration from. You know, if I'm going to open the first wide-ranging question. Sure. Tell me about yourself a little bit. Kirk, I'm a, uh, the, the simple thing is I'm a kid from a small postage size town east of Cleveland, Wycliffe, Ohio which growing up, I was always looked at, our, our town was always looked at as an underdog. And I took pride in being an underdog. Um, that coupled with having um, somewhat of inspiration to me, like my father, Sam Foti, and my mother's father, uh, Ben Chamalia, who came to America in 1921 with an eighth grade education. And people told him, you know, uh, as an Italian immigrant, Ben, you'll never amount to anything. Um, I, there's something about it. I always took pride in that. You know, I'm um, coming out of high school. I did decent in high school. I had some family members that didn't think I would amount to much, other than maybe my long hair needed to end up in the army, and that didn't work. Um, but I've always aspired to looking at situations and look at looking at something and saying. What could we do to make it better? And the simple story I'll give you is that when I was a little boy, I had weekend visitation rights with my dad. My parents had divorced when I was quite young. And my dad, who's a mechanical gen engineering genius, I would bring in my electric trains. I'd say, Dad, you know, my, my locomotive doesn't work. Not only would my dad fix it, but he would look at how it was made and he made it work better. So that impression was very much on a five, six-year-old boy. And it always stayed with me. And so my interest being in electronics, I used to always look at things and figure, how could I make this better? Um, one, the quest of you know, pushing the bar and making something better, but also probably the quest of trying to hopefully do something that my, that my dad would be proud of. Sounds like throughout your early life, you experienced a lot of change. And probably in, the, in your professional life, you have too. As the CEO now, looking over the TELUS Alliance, how do you approach change nowadays? Well, first of all, I don't refer to the, the position as CEO. I refer to it uh, utilizing an Italian phrase of il padrino, which is the godfather in Italian. Um, and I, I know a lot of people like to joke with me about the whole godfather thing, but when you think about the movie and not the violence part, is that, you know, the godfather, be it Vito or Michael, it was they were the executive officers of an organization that was successful. Matter of fact, if we went to that type of organization in our government, we might be more successful. Uh, I'm sorry, no locker room talk, I understand. Uh, but seriously, um, um, your question was about change, if I'm correct. Uh, first of all, Kirk, to deal with change, your eyes and ears and your heart have to be open at all times. Um, it's real easy to get locked in thinking that we do this, or I do this, and it's got to stay that way. Or, or I'm going to be a bull in a china shop, and I'm going to see my agenda through. But um, when you look at the way the world has moved, and since our company or our organization is technological-based, if, if we're not uh, flexible and have open minds and hearts to look at the way the world is moving in technology, um, you know, our core business has been broadcasting, uh, dealing with audio. We're, you know, we would have been out of business years ago. And, and that's something that uh, I know was within me back in my days of working in radio. It was very much in, you know, Steve Church, you know, our, our late founder, at least founder of Telos. And Steve and I always talked about that, you know. And so if, if your mind isn't open to look at change, and be willing to accept um, change or to be thinking about, oh, if I push in this direction, we could affect change. You know? and, 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 and if you look at history over the 30 plus years of our organization, we've driven change. You know, the whole, 
you know, what Steve started with the uh, Telos 10, that was that was huge change of, you know, having some adaptive filter to, to create a hybrid that worked well. Uh, marrying an audio codec with uh, ISDN, you know, you know, the product that became the Zephyr, change again. You know, probably our biggest one, audio over IP, you know, um, and that's turned into a world standard, AES67. Uh, a little over a year ago, it wasn't changed so much, but it was disruptive innovation, which changed a lot of things, was how we went about dealing with, um, you know, the, uh, the challenges to radio broadcasters in the States with respect to the um, Nielsen watermark, you know. I mean, no one thought of that. In, in a way, it's a, it's a bit of a microcosm of what Steve Jobs had done with Apple. I mean, no one envisioned that taking some audio player and marrying it to a phone would make this off the charts, unbelievable thing, but it did. What I originally knew as Telosomnia and then Telosomnia Axia uh, in the last few years has become what we're calling the Telos Alliance. Tell us what that is. I know I should, I'm, I'm not going to try to answer a question with a question, but if you think of GMC, the General Motors Corporation, you know, that's really an alliance of car companies, you know, Chevrolet, Pontiac, Oldsmobile, things of that nature. And rather than trying to take any of our brand names like Tello Systems or Omnia or Linear Acoustic and trying to make it, you know, television audio by Omnia, um, there's brand equity in those names. So the idea was to identify them all and have some um, unifying umbrella, if you will. And that's what the Telos Alliance is. It's like a unifying umbrella. We're leaning on the Telos name because it was the first one. Um, and the whole concept of alliance is bringing things together. And um, by keeping it in, utilizing the name that we chose, it, it allows for expansion. And in the time of, you know, what became the Telos Alliance, we added um, two organizations to that, 25-7 and uh, Minnetonka Audio out of Minnesota. Thinking about uh, your role in leadership in the, in the company and setting some direction, who do you look up to nowadays? Well, I've, I've been very, very fortunate. Um, close to home, I, I've looked up to my father, who is still with us, He's a very successful businessman. Uh, he's 85 years old, still works because he wants to. He went into business for himself at the age of 50, and at that time it was my father, my stepmother, uh, my brothers, and my sister. Um, that was in 1982. Today that company is over 350 people in Northeast, Cle in Northeast Ohio, uh, very successful. Um, and my dad still works because he, he it brings him joy. Um, the people that I looked up to, um, um, Obviously, I had the chance to collaborate and work with Steve Church. So in some ways, I looked up to Steve, but, you know, we became like brothers from other mothers. Um, I always looked up to Walt Disney um, and some of Thomas Edison in there. But the aspect of Walt Disney that I've always loved was Walt had a way um, of innovating, you know, I mean, you know, from drawing a mouse and also a big fan of railroading. <laughs> Um, but when you think of the innovations that have happened in the movie industry that were driven by Walt and his, what were known as Imagineers, you know, I mean, engineers that were being innovative, you know, and, and Walt, who basically had this idea one night uh, while riding his eighth scale live steam railroad in his backyard of like, how do I come up with a place that would bring joy and love to everyone? And the concept of Disneyland came out of his railroad. So I think of Walt quite a bit because the way he, he was such a visionary and he did it, you know, um, with passion, dedication. He did it with love, you know. Um, I'm told that the people that were around him, I mean, they loved being around him. I, I, the Disney company today may be totally altogether different than when Walt and his brother Roy were alive, but... Um, and what I've learned about Walt has been um, um, a good inspiration to me. And I, I would also throw Steve Jobs in there, too. You know, I mean, again, guy that, you know, um, he did change the world, you know. Um, and, you know, I've read a lot about him. Uh, you know, we've 
rubbed elbows in years past with some people at Apple. I mean, um, the guy, you know, the guy really knew his stuff. You know, and again, it wasn't like he went and studied this stuff. He just had something in him that he brought to the world in the same way that Walt had something in him that he brought to the world, in the same way that Steve Church had something in him that he brought to the world. You know, hopefully, you know, when it's all said and done, people may feel the same about the left-handed Sicilian kid from Wycliffe, Ohio. I think uh, some years ago uh, you were referred to as a junk scientist. And this leads me to the question, um, how do you learn uh, Kirk, learning is something that I'm always um, intrigued by, and it can be technical, you know, because we're technology driven, um, and it can be personal, you know. Uh, I've always been someone who would, you know, the things that I'm passionate about, I want to know as much about as possible. And uh, at an early age, I made the decision to start playing around in radio on a full time basis, and at the time was attempting to go to college. Um, I, I think of the Bruce Springsteen story where his parents, once he's already very successful, and they're like, you know, Bruce, you could still, you could always go back to college. You know, my parents didn't do that to me, but um, I, I, I can remember having this interest in signal processing at, when I was working at WMMS in Cleveland. And uh, I would go home at night and I would take the manuals to the uh, compressors and limiters and the stereo generator, and I would, you know, study the schematics and I'd read the circuit descriptions, and a lot of which I didn't understand, but I just kept at it and kept at it and kept at it. And you know, there, we had a few that were, were sitting on the shelf that either needed to be repaired or were spares, and I would set them on the bench. I'd take the top off. I'd put signals through them. I'm like, oh, I see how that works now. And then slowly but surely, as, as you know, as um, I started to grasp what was going on. I started to get some ideas of like, well, wait a minute, what if I try this? And one thing led to another, and uh, late one night in, uh, in the engineering shop in uh, Z100 in New York, I made some modifications to an audio processor and kicked it on the air and was like, you know, I had one of those holy, you know, SH something <laughs> moments. And uh, um, one thing led to another, and, you know, th this crazy little thing that became cutting edge, and now Omnia got started. I want to move to FM processing in a moment, but first let's touch quickly on television audio processing. We have a division that handles that in real time, linear mm -hmm. acoustic. Uh, what, what, uh, what are they doing that's innovative or what's important about what they're doing at linear? Well, um, a story that's probably not commonly known about linear um, is that years ago when the um, digital television system was being talked about for, the, for domestic broadcasting, um, someone who was a mentor of mine, and I should have mentioned him earlier, Jim Samich. Uh, Jim and I thought, why don't we get a, a leg up on doing signal processing for television so that we're in place when they launch it? And so both of us had done a lot of studying on what was the Dolby Digital system, and we even bought a Dolby Digital encoder decoder, thinking, well, you know, there's this whole metadata um, infrastructure, and we'll learn about it, and we'll you know, there's probably some things we could learn. Well, long and short story was the contact for us at Dolby at that time was a fellow by the name of Tim Carroll. And Tim was sent to Cleveland by the people at Dolby to politely tell us, uh, guys, um, we'll sell you the gear, but you're not going to be allowed to have access to the metadata. And, you know, people like Jim, myself, and Steve Church you know, we don't take no for an answer too kindly. <laughs> Not that we threw Tim out of the building, mind you, but we figured we're going to figure this out. So um, we started work on doing, a, you know, doing some work for TV processing, and along came HD radio, which consumed all of my time. Meanwhile, Tim made the decision to leave Dolby, and Tim had this idea of like, you know, my friend Frank had this idea of, you know, um, getting into the metadata system, and I know where the bones are buried. So that's how Linear was born. Um, we had, let's say, a left-handed uh, assist in that. So um, the benefit of the Linear products is that if anyone knows more about how the digital television system signal path operates, you know, Tim Carroll knew it all. And um, he launched the product um, or I should say he launched linear acoustic that way 
And um, as you know, we understand in the business, you know, the way since we know how to understand and deal with the Dolby Digital System probably better than anyone else, it, that's put us in the forefront. Um, obviously, uh, television is about to embark upon change yet again. You know, uh, the new digital television system is going to uh, introduce immersive audio. Um, and while Tim has made the life decision to uh, migrate back to Dolby and, you know, as I understand it, doing great work for them, we still have additional people within uh, Linear as well as our group at Minnetonka who do a lot of work in the television world that were at the forefront and will remain at the forefront on immersive audio for even the new uh, television system. So it, it appears that from the get-go, either one way or another, we had our bases covered, and we'll continue to do that. What about this uh, division called Minnetonka Audio? I understand we're helping people with, I guess I would call cloud-based or maybe workflow audio. What's that about? Well, Kirk, the future in broadcasting, whether folks want to recognize it or not, is in the cloud. Um, you know, one of the innovations, disruptive innovations that we brought to the industry over 10 years ago was audio over IP. Um, you know, thanks to Steve Church and Greg Shea for, you know, um, doing the grunt level or the low level work on audio over IP. Um, the next phase is, I mean, since it's all data based and we live in a, you know, connected world, um, the cloud is, is the future. Um, you know, it goes back to um, a story that I've shared a few times, and that is over 20 years ago, Steve and I had a vision that there would be a day where a broadcast facility, and at the time we were just thinking radio, but this would apply to, you know, you know uh, what do we call radio with pictures, um, you know, television. Um, that's coming from a radio guy, mind you. Um, that one day there would be a box in a corner, and in the box was everything. It was the playout system, it was the disc jockey or the announcer, it was, you know, everything running in software. Well, that day of the box being in the corner is really going to be probably some farm somewhere. Um, I'm saying that because Minnetonka are, you know, again, John Schur and his group are forward thinkers, and they started realizing that there's going to be a need to have applications that are we, what we may call apps or applications, but they're really software versions of hardware pieces we make now. And even all that's you know, software-based, and it's sitting somewhere on a server. You know, the simple example is you know, uh, some post-production house in L.A. needs to add some specialized audio treatment or some upmix to something for a television show, a movie, or what have you. And they may not want to you know, purchase a specialized piece of gear. Well, you can go online or you can, you know, route it through the cloud and, 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 and get your treatment. Um, that's probably the simplest form. At some point, I, I would see broadcasters basically saying, um, we're going to create a network of radio stations or a group of broadcast outlets. And it's all going to be, you know, point and click off, off a phone, off a touch screen and uh, a signal is going to show up somewhere, so a transmitter, and go into the transmitter and, and, and over the air. Um, now, I'm not saying that that will be the only way. You know, there's still people today that are doing what you and I might refer to as old school broadcasting, where there's a studio and um, mixing consoles that are still analog and utilizing what we refer to as analog transmission gear into an older transmitter. And that'll still be around, but it'll dwindle. But the future is connectivity. The future is the cloud. And, you know, broadcasting is, you know, we grew up where it, it was electromagnetic waves that showed up in the amplitude modulation band or the frequency modulation band. You know, broadcasting is a signal that's showing up to some device a listener has, and it could be AM, FM, it could be car radio, it could be phone, could be delayed, you know, in the form of some stream. Um, it's, you know, the world has changed. So Minnetonka, to answer your question, they're very involved in that, and they're also very involved in workflow um, uh, signal processing where people would use apps or programs 
um, you know, where preconditioning could be added to programs, if you will, um, and then put into the infrastructure of the broadcast facility. It sounds like with Minnetonka's experience and with the vast amount of actual broadcast experience that, that Telos Alliance employees have, and, and of course our great partnerships and friendships, we might get to a day, you mentioned old school broadcasting, where an old school broadcaster could, from the comfort of his home, go online just before his radio show starts and select, I like that Shure SM7 mic. That's right. I, I want a Shure level lock because that was always my favorite. That's right. And um, and uh, I want to bring my music library in the you know that's maybe PD approved, and do his show. That's right. Using a virtual interface. Yep. And that would be a lot. He could do that live. He or she could do yep. that live yep. with a VoIP uh, with connectivity. Yep. And have it show up at the transmitter site that's or right. the stream or wherever. I guess Telos would like to be a, a part of that kind of future. Should that be where the things go? You know, t uh, Kirk. I'm going to I'm going to go out on a limb and say that we're in the we're already in the process of being part of that future, okay, um, and it's something that will happen. Um, and our challenge as an organization is, since we're embarking into this domain, we will have to serve multiple masters because you know even to this day when I, I talked about something like this a few weeks ago, at another conference. And I had a handful of people come up afterwards saying, hey, you know, that's pretty cool, but I still want you to make me a box. I still want a phone system. I still and, and I said, we got you covered. We've got your back. And that part will, will always ring true and remain true because at, at the end of the day, Frank Foti was a broadcaster in the trenches. Steve was a broadcaster in the trenches. Same for you and a number of our other, you know, colleagues. And, you know, um, it, it's kind of like family. You, you can never let them down, you know. There's a handful of people in our industry that if they call or text me or email me, I, I just stop what I'm doing and, and, and I go to help them because I've got that bond with them. And I like to look at the people that we've been honored to have them give us business, that we've got to support that too, you know. Yes, it's cool to look at new and cool things and to push the bar, but we can't ever forget how we got there. And those those people matter every much as they're equally as important to us as the, you know, future directions we plan on going. Let's talk about FM processing. That's where the, uh, a lot of your heart is. You got started It'll there. Probably always be there. <laughs> a couple of inter uh, really interesting technologies. Uh, one is uh, something that uh, we introduced, uh, Leif, and then later we called it One Louder. And now I understand we have uh, in our hands some uh, additional technologies. To make an FM station louder and use, use more of the available spectrum on the you know, modulation spectrum without processing any harder, can you uh, give us a little preview of, of, uh, of these technologies? Well, a couple things. The, the one louder thing is, is actually was mutually done independently by Leif and myself. Um, the short description of that is in the FM stereo um, system for the analog carrier or conventional carrier, um, theoretically you give up 10% modulation for the pilot. So, you know, if you look at the mod modern, you turn the pilot off, the uh, modulation would drop to 90%. Well, we've come up with an innovative method of embedding the pilot, meaning that we're allowing the audio to go out to the full 100% modulation, such that if you turn the pilot off, the audio is still at 100%. Now, that 10% modulation that we're using to embed the pilot is 1 dB in audio. Now, for our conversation here today, to change the level of my voice by 1 dB because it's unprocessed, there's not much of a level change. But the output of an audio processor where there's um, a high degree of signal control that's been applied and density, we change that signal by 1 dB, that's, that's that subliminal benefit that could push the happy button of a program director over the edge. And, and by the way, it's, it's, it's analogous to taking the um, older style of FM stereo transmission and increasing the modulation by 10%. But you're getting the benefit of 110% modulation, yet everything is still at 100% normal modulation. And we're not doing it by uh, um, creating any distortion in the form of clipping 
Uh, we're not modulating the pilot because if you bring this up on a, a modulation monitor, the pilot is rock solid. If you look at it on a spectrum analyzer, the protection in and around the 19 kilohertz pilot signal is, you know, it's, it's theoretical. I mean, the, I've, I've measured protection of the pilot as much as 90 dB, you know, where, you know, 40 dB of protection alone is, 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 is quite sufficient. So um, that's a step forward. And by the way, that's in um, our key flagship products, the 11, Omni 11, 9, and the 7. And, um, you know, you, you can hear it. You know, I've, you've, I've run two of our products side by side, one with embedding, one without embedding, and you switch back and forth, and the one just appears a little louder. The other part is comes down to the um, secret sauce, if you will, inside signal processing. Um, over the years and through a lot of, you know, you're asking about learning earlier. Um, I remember it was about 10 years ago. We were at the point where our, we were going to celebrate, I think, Omnia's 10-year anniversary. And um, somebody asked me, well, they said, well, what's the future? I said, well, broadcasters are never going to say turn it down. They're going to want to maintain the competitive le level. But we're at a point now where it's so hammered, if we don't dial some quality back in, you know, it's time to turn in our keys. So that led me to uh, um, uh, about a three-year exploration project into what was causing the processing systems to get annoying, for lack of a better term. And what I learned was that the whole concept of how we deal with what's called intermodulation distortion that's, that can be added or affected by audio processing was adding to this annoyance factor. I started by doing the work in the probably the more, most difficult area, which is the hard limiting or the clipping system, and came up with a method to um, radically reduce the amount of intermodulation or IM distortion. And then my partner in crime, uh, Cornelius Gould, basically in, you know, because Corny and I have shared a lot of ideas over the years, and I explained to him, you know, what the concepts were, and he said, hmm, I wonder, do you think if I took those ideas do you think I could factor them into the dynamics controls, like the limiters and the uh, compressors? I said, Corny, it's worth a shot. Well, you know, again, being somebody who's inquisitive and self-taught, you know, Corny, uh, he came back and he said, Frank, take a listen to this. So, you know, um, a lot of this was the genesis of what became Omni 11, but in the recent couple of years, Corny's taken it yet a couple steps further um, and put it into this um, um, platform that we call GeForce, and, um, you know, the whole concept is to be able to yield as much quality uh, on the air, yet maintain uh, the competitive loudness levels that broadcasters require. And I'm not saying this, Kirk, because I'm a loudness monger. I've had people, you know, accuse me, oh, you know, you get one of those Omnia or Cutting Edge or Fody boxes, it's because you just want to be rock and roll and loud. Well, I'll tell you, we cover both ends of the spectrum. We're on the most competitive sounding radio stations in the world, yet I can tell you that on the most critical sounding radio stations that play classical music, you know, um, probably I don't know that I have clearance, you know, to share these call letters, but I'll say that in Boston, Chicago, Cleveland, um, and abroad, you know, um, some very well-known state broadcasters abroad, they, they, purposely went through rigorous tests and at the end they chose our they chose our product because it was able to maintain the level of audio quality that they require and you know you want to sit and you want to sit and talk nuanced audio sit down with a program director of a classical or a fine arts radio station and you'll learn a thing or two so you know if we're able to cover both ends of the spectrum successfully i would think that the statistics are in our, 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 in our favor, that we can get everything in between. We had a, a new convert to uh, Omnia processing recently, uh, put in a new Omnia processor, <clears throat> and it included declipping and, um, and G-Force, and he's, either he or his program director is now quoted as saying, even the silence sounds better. <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> um, that's pretty cool. But you know, I mean, in a way, that kind of lets it be known that we take every aspect of the um, sonic signature to heart. You know, that's why 
you know, when people come up and they'll, they'll say to me, but, you know, you know, why didn't you put more flashing graphics or lights on it? And I, I just politely say, look, the listener, the listener can't see the graphics on the front of the processor. Although, you know, we, I think, I'd like to think we've done some pretty good, yeah. cool things with our graphics and displays. But at the end of the day, it comes down to what's coming out of the, what's coming out of the radio. And I will put the per sonic performance of our product up against anyone's on the face of the planet. And, you know, if, if somebody can uh, show me, you know, that there's a, a benefit to something else, you know, I'll tip my hat to them. But, you know, I've been doing this since 1988. And as of yet, you know, we're, we still seem to be the, the chosen three out of four times. One more thing about FM uh, processing and transmission is this technology you've been talking about lately uh, that uh, Hans von Zutphen has, has helped to develop, and that is, we're calling it micro MPX. What does that do for an engineer or a broadcaster? This is an outgrowth of what we debuted a few years ago with Nautel, which was the MPX signal um, over AES. Uh, that was the first uh, successful digital link uh, from a stereo generator into a transmitter. And that's done with a wire. It's typically not done across a uh, Well, it could be done over link. a network, but, it, but it's going to require a huge amount of bandwidth, uh, over, yeah. over 2 megabytes per second. And no one's got that data, and if you're paying for your data on a link, it's, it, I mean, the cost would be outrageous. So the challenge is how do you get that down into something that's efficient and more affordable? And, you know, our colleagues, Hans and um, um, his um, running mate Matthias came up with a way where they created a codec that will take the composite signal and efficiently be able to pass it over a transom that's running 320 kilobits per second. Now, one that most people have that kind of a link, either by way of a radio or you know um, a point-to-point -point nailed up circuit. And but the most important thing is is that this codec does not degrade the oral performance. It does not undo the peak control done by the audio processor. And it, unlike uh, codecs that we're familiar with, like MP3, AAC, things of that nature, where we know we're knocking holes in the spectrum, they're, they're, doing a, um, they're doing it differently. The penalty is some added noise that, um, from their artifacts that falls into the FM trans, you know, transmission system. So, um, and they've done, you know, um, listening tests that's shown that, you know, it's, it's basically the difference. It was very difficult to determine what was micro MPX as compared to what was not micro MPX. So what we now have is a way to um, put the composite signal into a, um, a distributed network. It's done at an um, efficient uh, data rate. And considering that, you know, there's, um, what's growing in the United States are these single frequency networks. The supplies there. We know internationally there's a huge um, need for it. Where you know a lot of these quote unquote networks, you know, and which are actually commercial networks of a radio station getting distributed all over the country. Um, basically, they can now have you know one point of you know uh, transmission. Basically, get it out there, and they know that what they're sending out will be properly printed, if you will, um, um, at all points of transmission. So again, you know, innovation, disruption, I mean, it's, you know, I, I, I know, you know, we, we showed the tech at NAB, you know, this past year, there's, you know, they're, they're still doing some cleanup work on some things. And I, I know there were some other organizations that were touting, you know, um, MPX over network, but, you know, it sucked a lot of bandwidth. It had a few other challenges. Again, you know, it's that raising the bar, it's pushing it out there, trying to come up with ways to do things. On the surface, somebody might say, oh, you know, Frank, that's pretty cool. But deeper down, it, it needs to be a benefit, you know, bring something to the industry that, you know, that they didn't know they needed and it would be of benefit to them. Frank, I remember it was, it was right about 20 years ago, you and I had lunch just up the street in a restaurant in Cleveland, Ohio, and we were talking about this new internet streaming audio thing. And I remember we were, we were talking about, we had real audio, I think, at the time. Right. And I said, Frank, what do you think about this streaming? He said, it's pretty interesting. I said, 
yeah, but it sounds pretty bad, doesn't he? He says, yeah, it sounds really bad, is yeah, what you said. It was and I said, Frank, do you think you could figure out a way to make streaming audio sound better by doing something to the audio so that it sounds good at the consumer end? Now, 20 years later, kind of tell me where we are and if there's anything ahead for coded audio, which I eventually will take over the world. Well, a couple things. Um, in 20 years, uh, the development of Codex has been, you know, like a quantum leap. You know, um, we've been very fortunate to be uh, quite close to probably the premier codec developer, and that's Fraunhofer in Germany. So while we've never been able to look under the hood, um, they've kept us uh, close to the vest, and we've been, and actually we've been privileged from time to time to give them feedback on their on their efforts, and they've, you know. Fraunhofer and, and, and even, you know, the people that have done other work like, like Coding Technologies and uh, some others have, you know, hats off to them. Um, but like anything, it's a transmission uh, path. Um, and like anything, they all have their strengths and they all have their weaknesses. So we took the time to uh, try to find out where the gremlins were. And we came up with algorithms that would precondition the audio so that as it passed through the codec, you know, what came out on the other end would be sound as good as possible. And, and even just a few weeks ago, um, again, um, my running mate, Corny, uh, Corny Gould, uh, sh sh uh, shared with me some dynamics algorithms he was working on for coded audio that r raised the bar yet again. At, you know, I mean, again, low bit rates, stereo, where the audio just sounded amazing. So um, as we've seen with the progression of what you know were household words and AM, FM, um, and television. You know, each one had its own dedicated method for broadcasting and had its own dedicated requirements for sig conditioning audio. Um, the the internet or streaming uh, for audio, if it's audio only or audio along with pictures, um, has its own set of requirements as well, and that's going to continue to evolve. Um, you know, the, the beauty about the, you know, having the data connection is that we're able to packetize additional information in there. And the whole concept of metadata is huge. And done right, it can further improve the listener experience. Frank, why should engineers, or content creators, uh, owners of media outlets, why should they look to the Telos Alliance for uh, disruptive innovation, things that will make them better in one way or another. Kirk, you said it, it's, it's disruptive innovation. Um, uh, you know, on one hand, we brought numerous things to the industry that the world didn't need, they didn't know they needed, okay? Um, it's a smaller version of, let's say, when Jobs brought out the iPhone. Um, you look at, you know, I think I mentioned it earlier, the, the telephone hybrid. Uh, we did, uh, you know, we were the first to be success very successful with audio codecs. We were the first to properly do uh, digital audio processing. And then within that, you know, uh, raise the bar. We, you know, we have people that swear by the use of our single sideband suppressed carrier that, that they're reaching, you know, people can hear their radio stations that never could hear them before. Um, I, you know, live wire um, it, um, in and of itself. Um, as long as I'm, you know, still involved, that will continue. And when I look at, you know, um, and I, I'm not saying, I'm, I'm just saying this because it's a matter of fact, actually. When you look at the people that compete with us, they're all me too, you know? They, they kind of look at like, well, okay, Telos did this. So, you know, Telos created, you know, I'm not saying that we created the ice cream sundae, but let's say we did. Our, our competitors might come along and say, well, maybe we'll put a, a cherry on top. <laughs> Great, cool. You know, um, best of luck to you, you know. Um, and so if, 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 if you're a fan of Me Too, that's great. Um, I worked with a guy many years ago in a radio station. He had a phrase that I love. He'd say, you can look at situations in one of two ways. You can either play to win or you could play not to lose. I choose to play to win. Playing not to lose is somebody's going to beat you because you're playing it safe. And I look at people that compete with us, they play not to lose. We play to win. We strike out every once in a while. I'll admit it. But I know at the end of the game, when I walk off that field, I will have left every ounce of blood and guts out there. And I, I win or lose, I will 
never have any regret. So, you know, to a broadcaster, if you want to be involved with the guys that are pushing the envelope, please, you know, we'd, we'd, we'd love to hear from you. We, and we've been honored to be around a lot of those innovators. And I worked with a lot of them, you know. I mean, Scott Shannon, you know, Scott was an innovator, still is. You know, when I worked at WMMS in the 70s, John Gorman and that crew, they were innovators. They were, you know, I took influence from that, you know, wasn't product wise, but they were constantly pushing the envelope. Scott to this day is constantly pushing the envelope. And I love that. And that was one of the things that, you know, Steve Church was always, you know, um, uh, he admired that. You know, Steve and I were probably frustrated program directors because we used to compare notes about radio all the time. And even, and, 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 you know, as a tip of our hat to those great broadcasters, there were times Steve and I would be wrestling with something. could be technology, a business thing. And Steve would look across the table and he'd say, Frank, if Shannon was here right now, what would he do? And I'd, and I'd think about it and I'd say, Scott would go, he'd say, you know, let's go kick their butt. And, that, and, and that's what we did. So there's a lot of radio, you know, the radio, infra, not infrastructure, but passion and philosophy that has really shaped who we are. So we are broadcasters and we're there. We're in the trenches. I, you know, I, I, I can remember like it was yesterday, the pager going off, having to get out there. So why should somebody come and be with us? Well, let, let me put it to you this way, you know, being from Northeast Ohio, do you want to be on team with LeBron James or do you want to be on a team with, you know, all the other wannabes? You know, I mean, LeBron's 31 years old and they're saying he's still the best out there. I'd like to think that, you know, the effort we bring day after day is right up there with someone like LeBron James. I'd like to think that on a day-to-day day -day basis, we bring sweat and dedication, just like Bruce Springsteen brings night after night after night, as he would say, you know, Bruce comes out, no intermission, and he'll play for four hours, you know? And when, when you leave, you're more drenched than he is. And that's how we are. So, it, you know, if you're that kind of broadcaster, and it matters to you, and you got dedication, drive, and passion, we're there. And we'd love to, you know, if we're not working with you already, we'd, whoever it is, we'd love to be working with you. you. You may have already answered my last question, and that is when, when, uh, when, when the time comes that you're spending little or no time at the office and you're enjoying your trains, live steaming or a model, uh, when you're enjoying maybe a trip back to Italy to see family and friends right. you, you have there, uh, what is it that you want to be remembered for in the, in, in the broadcast industry? Well, Kirk, I, I've been blessed. I mean, I'm not a religious guy. I'm more spiritual, but I've been blessed, you know. I, I got on some great teams, um, and they all affected me, and hopefully I contributed to them. Um, and I like to think that there's pieces and parts of um, – WELW, WMMS, WHK, KNEW, WKSAN, WHTZ in our company, along with Wycliffe Senior High. You know, again, goes back to that being an underdog. Um, on account of the fact that life's treated me well and treated our company well, uh, and I've tried to be the type of leader where the definition being that, I, you know, when people come in the office and they say, oh, there's the boss. I always say, oh, Springsteen's not here. You know, uh, I like people to, to feel that I was a guy that was in and among a group of people and somehow they ended up further down the road. They didn't know that they got there, but somehow I was somehow involved with the throttle. But to answer your question, I, I like to live by a phrase that was a movie made about called paying it forward. You know, life's treated me well. If there's a way that I was able to contribute to products or the organization or people's lives, be it professionally or personally, when it's all said and done, that's what matters most to me because, you know, I, I want of nothing. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I'm very fortunate to be able to have done what I've done, to continue to do what I'm doing. Um, I intend to do it for a while yet. Um, yes, there's coal to burn and model trains to build. And, um, and if some pretty girl will have me, you know, chase her around a little bit. But other than that, um, I'm... I couldn't be happier, you know. It's, um, it's been a great life, and life willing, it'll continue to be a great life. Mm -hmm.